Good morning. I call this hearing to order. I want to thank everyone for joining us today in the Economic Opportunity Subcommittee. Today we're convening to receive another update on VA's implementation of the Forever GI Bill, and specifically whether the Department is ready to fully implement Sections 107 and 501 on December 1st. Uh, it's been more than two years since Congress passed the Forever GI Bill into law in August of 2017. The VA was given one year to implement the Forever GI Bill, which was by no means an easy task. Uh, VA had to make major modifications to its legacy information technology systems that processed education claims and payments in order to process the monthly housing allowance changes required by Sections 107 and 501. The fact that we're still modifying outdated systems for veterans' education benefits is an issue that we must address sooner rather than later. Uh, nonetheless, VA repeatedly reported to Congress that the work was on track. Uh, that was until July 2018, one month before implementation, when VA raised concerns about implementing the bill on time. Uh, the botched implementation in August of 2018 led to thousands of veterans either not receiving their housing stipend for months or receiving an erroneous amount. Uh, many veterans, as we all know, rely on their monthly housing stipend to pay for their living expenses while they attend classes that will prepare them for opportunities in the job market. There were stories of veterans being evicted and facing other economic hardships. Uh, the Inspector General conducted its own assessment, as well as requesting that MITRE conduct an independent technical assessment to identify why this occurred. Uh, the findings were stark. Uh, in the past, the VA lacked an accountable leader who could oversee project delivery, uh, and I quote, resulting in unclear communication of implementation progress and inadequately defined expectations, roles, and responsibilities of the various VA business lines and contractors involved, end quote. That's something that we can't afford to repeat, which is why Congress, and specifically this subcommittee, has been closely tracking VA's progress for the last year. Uh, in our previous hearings regarding the President's budget request, we examined the shortfalls in Forever GI Bill implementation. In May 2019, we held a joint hearing with the Technology Modernization Subcommittee on VA's progress in updating IT systems and processes to meet the implementation date. VA's officials since have provided our subcommittee staff with monthly updates on the status of IT system modifications and assured they will not repeat the mistakes of the past. Uh, and I appreciate that very much. In last month, I traveled to VA's Muskogee, Oklahoma regional office and saw firsthand uh, the systems that VA uses to process education claims. I'm grateful to uh, the Undersecretary and others for joining me uh, on that visit. Uh, I learned a lot. It's obviously uh, very important that we continue to modernize the systems that are in place. Uh, we've repeatedly asked if VA officials are getting today and in uh, the future, what they need uh, to provide our nation's veterans the benefits uh, that they deserve. Uh, this committee urges the department to be forthright about their needs, which I trust that you will be. Uh, and as you know, Congress has to uh, juggle several funding requests across the federal government, and as is often the case, the squeaky wheel uh, gets the grease. Uh, nonetheless, the focus of today's hearing is on the implementation of sections 107 and 501. And it's just 12 days away. In 12 days, those changes are scheduled to go into effect. Uh, progress seems to be on track, uh, but we've got to perform our oversight duty to ensure smooth implementation without unintended adverse effects uh, to veterans. Uh, our opportunity here today is to see where things stand uh, and learn from the failures of the past and hopefully uh, build on that for the future. I look forward to hearing the testimony from our witnesses uh, to do just that. Uh, and with now, I'd like to recognize Congressman Bergman, who's sitting in for Ranking Member Bill Arrakis, uh, for five minutes for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for joining us at today's subcommittee hearing on the continued implementation of the Harry W. Colmary Veterans Education Assistance Act of 2017, also known as the Forever GI Bill. This bill was signed into law by President Trump on August 16th, 2017, and is one of the best illustrations of the work that Congress can get done when we work together in a bipartisan manner. This was the first major improvement to the GI Bill since 2011 and encompassed over 30 provisions brought forth by many members of this House who all share our commitment to the men and women who serve either in uniform or alongside their active duty spouse or parent. As we all know, 
Despite the best efforts and good intentions many of many in the Department, VA was unable to meet the August 1 deadline of 2018 effective date for Sections 107 and 501 of this law. This failure led to some of the most significant GI Bill processing delays since the program, program's rocky rollout in 2009. Students suffered severe financial hardships because of these delays, and even today, thousands of veterans are still not being paid the correct amount of monthly housing allowance under the law. Some are being overpaid, and some are being underpaid. It is because of this subcommittee's hearings and bipartisan oversight that many of these issues came to light. On November 28, 2018, Secretary Wilkie issued a full stop on the development of the failed IT modifications and decided to reset development and implementation completely. I thank and praise the Secretary for making this difficult decision. This reset aimed at full implementation by December 1, 2019, which, as we know, is rapidly approaching. Since this reset, VA has done a great job of keeping the committee informed of their efforts to get the system online, as well as keeping schools and students informed about upcoming changes, many of which could have significant financial impact on students' monthly housing allowance. It is my understanding from staff and member meetings that VA is poised to meet the December 1 deadline and deliver the changes as required by law. We have come a long way from last November's issues of blue screens of death and lack of bandwidth that hampered processors' ability to do their jobs. I want to give significant credit to Dr. Lawrence, Ass Assistant Secretary Jiffer, and their dedicated teams of career VA employees and contractors for their efforts to get this right. While it is important to acknowledge that it has been done, we still have questions that need to be answered about where VA goes from here. Today, I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses witnesses how they are going to first ensure every veteran that has been owed money as a result of IT failures, some since August 1st, 2018, will be made whole, as well as a timeline on when students can expect such payments. Second, provide proper accounting for the amount of money in the overpayments that are going to be forgiven as a result of these payments delays. And lastly, provide resources and attention to upgrading current VA legacy systems to ensure that the types of delays that occurred never happen again. These legacy systems have been hanging on a thread for far too long, and calls from this subcommittee about the need for significant upgrades have been ignored by senior VA political leaders, especially those from the previous administration, for far too long. The forever GI Bill won't be the last time that Congress changes this educational program, which means that it's time for VA to build a truly agile system that is prepared for the inevitable evolution of this great benefit. Before I yield back, I want to take a moment to say thank you to the student veterans and schools for their patience and understanding throughout this whole process. The IT systems failures and associated delays with the implementation of this law have been a burden for all involved. I am hopeful that today we can highlight the good work that has been done to finally get this right. I thank our panel for being here, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Congressmember Bergman. Appreciate your remarks, and I'd now like to recognize the ranking member of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, Dr. Rowe, for five minutes for his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for recognizing me. It's important that we're here today to review the implementation of the Forever GI Bill. As one of the co-authors of this legislation, I was disappointed last year to witness the rocky implementation of Sections 107 and 501. Um, last August of uh, 2018, a year ago, I was in Springfield, Illinois, with Congressman uh, Rodney Davis at a roundtable, education roundtable, where we realized that there was a significant problem when we were talking to the community colleges and other colleges that were represented. Uh, as these delays were being uh, beginning to unfold, I applaud then Chairman Arrington and Ranking Member O'Rourke's efforts to understand where things went wrong and how the VA could work to imp uh, put implementation of this important law back on track. And I personally want to thank and acknowledge the work of Dr. Lawrence, uh, Assistant Secretary Jiffer, and Ms. Bogue, and Mr. Orfisi, and their talented staff for their hard work to straighten things out and get this right. I thank you for that work. Like many of the members today, I'm very interested to hear about VA's communication plans for alerting students to the changes to monthly housing allowance payments that will go into effect when the, student, when the student's January 1st payments begin. While no plan is foolproof, 
We must do all we can to ensure that every student is contacted and educated about the potential change to their housing allowance payments. These changes have, have the potential to impact thousands, and I'm concerned that despite VA's best efforts, some students will be very surprised when they see an un, unexpected decrease in payment on January 1. I'm also interested in hearing about the VA's plans to hold Secretary Wilkie's commitment that every student veteran who is shortchanged due to the IT failures are made whole. It's important to make sure these payments are made in a re responsible way so that they don't negatively impact the processing of spring enrollments. However, it is imperative that students have some idea of when they should expect their payments that they are owed under the law. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me and for holding this important hearing, and I thank the panel for being here today, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rowe. Uh, I'd uh, now like to get to our witnesses. Uh, we're fortunate to have true experts uh, from the VA, uh, also uh, MITRE Corporation. I'm grateful to all of you for being here. Uh, Dr. Paul Lawrence, uh, Undersecretary at the Veterans Benefits Administration, good to see you. Uh, Ms. Charmaine Bogue, uh, Executive Director of VBA Education Services, good to see you again. Uh, Mr. James Gaffarer, Assistant Secretary with VA's Office of Information and Technology. Uh, Mr. Robert Orofici, Information Technology Specialist in the Office of Information and Technology and Dr. Jay Schnitzer, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of the MITRE Corporation. Thank you all again uh, for joining us. As you know, you'll have five minutes for your oral statement, but your full written statement will be added to the record. Uh, Under Secretary Lawrence, I'd like to start with you, and you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and good morning, Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Bergman, and members of the subcommittees. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the status of VA's implementation of the Comary Act. On November 28, 2018, VA announced changes in the implementation of the Comary Act Sections 107 and 501, which deal primarily with the calculation of the monthly housing allowance. Secretary Wilkie announced a reset of VA's implementation to give the Department time, contracting support, and the resources necessary to develop the capability to process enrollments in accordance with the law by December 1, 2018. VA, VA established a Program Integration Office, or PIO, as a formal entity within the department made up of government leaders, staff, federally funded research and development center support, and contract support. The PIO captured business requirements for Sections 107 and 501, maintained an integrated master schedule, managed a program risk register, and reformulated the configure control process. Previously, VA engaged MITRE to perform an independent technical assessment of the capabilities necessary to meet the requirements of the Act. MITRE provided 20 recommendations intended to help VA successfully test and deploy the Colmary Act. Since the formation of the PIO in December 2018, OIT has worked diligently in partnership with VBA. OIT assigned proven leaders to partner with us in governance and leadership of the Comary Act delivery and co-located staff with VBA's education service. OIT has worked closely with us and MITRE to improve our requirements and testing process. Through these improvements, the team successfully deployed two software bills and updated five legacy systems in order to support the December 1st launch. These bills were completed on schedule and have been fully tested. Since the last hearing before this committee in May, we have successfully implemented each recommendation made by MITRE. MITRE's recommendations and support have been instrumental in the development and deployment of the new solution. We are on track to meet the December 1, 2019 launch date. I'm also proud to report that we have accomplished the requirements of public law to establish a TIGER team. VA CIO and I participate in the weekly TIGER team meetings and engage with the Colmary delivery team several times each week. Importantly, we are fulfilling the Secretary's promise to make every post-9-11 GI Bill beneficiary 100 percent whole. The process to correct housing records will continue through 2020 as VA will begin accepting updating rec updated records from schools in circumstances where the student was studying at a different campus than originally provided to VA. Also, as promised, if a student was overpaid due to VA's challenges in implementing the law, VA will notify the impacted student individually with the amount VA intends to waive. Concurrently, VA will review the debt to ensure it was incurred solely based on implementation of Sections 107 and 501. Upon confirmation, VA will notify the student of the completed waiver. 
In the process, VA does not require anything additional from the impacted student veterans. VA has numerous initiatives in place to better serve and inform schools. Veteran service organizations, state approving agencies, um, and the stakeholders of how implementation affects the student population and process. We provided nine monthly updates to Congress. We executed 40 direct email campaigns reaching over a million GI Bill students and other stakeholders. We participated in two conferences in July 2019 in which we had the opportunity to connect with nearly 1,400 representatives from schools across the country. VA also hosted 45 focus groups and webinars reaching over 30,000 school certifying officials and other stakeholders. During the webinar sessions, we outlined the extension campus updates, shared a timeline for future challenge changes, and provided opportunities to ask questions. VA held nine in-person and 16 virtual sessions with SCOs, allowing them to review and interact with our updates to the education processing IT system. The feedback from these was overwhelmingly positive. In addition, VA conducted Forever GI Bill School, uh, Forever GI Bill School, school Tour this past September visiting campuses across the country to reach students who are directly affected by the Forever GI Bill. We visited 16 states, North Carolina, New York, Maryland, Oklahoma, Virginia, and Texas, connecting with 15 schools and hundreds of GI Bill students. I personally visited the Community College of Allegheny County and the University of South Carolina, Columbia, where I hosted roundtables with students and school officials. I heard firsthand that the communication we have in place is reaching all levels successfully. VA has made tremendous strides towards developing and deploying the IT solution to support Sections 107 501. My first priority as Undersecretary is to provide veterans the benefits they've earned in a manner that honors their service. On December 1st, we will start providing the this, this same level of high customer service to our student veterans. Mr. Chairman, thank you for this concludes my testimony. We're prepared to respond to your questions. Thank you, Undersecretary Lawrence. Uh, Dr. Schnitzer. You're now recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Levin, Ranking Member Bergman, Ranking Member Dr. Rowe, and distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity, thank you for inviting us to testify before you again today on matters relating to the implementation of Sections 107 and 501 of the Colmary Act, also known as the Forever GI Bill. The law amended the location basis for the monthly housing allowance and allowed aligned those payments with the De Department of Defense's basic housing allowance rates. My name is Jay Schnitzer. I'm Vice President and Chief Technology Officer with the MITRE Corporation. I would like to make a brief statement and submit my full remarks for the record. MITRE is a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation operating federally funded research and development centers on behalf of federal agency sponsors, including the Department of Veterans Affairs. As I stated in my previous testimony in May, the challenges which impacted the Forever GIB Bill program one year ago have been seen repeatedly across the government as agencies struggle to execute highly complex integrated mission requirements and modernize their systems and processes to address new mission needs. At that time, I summarized the key findings from the independent technical assessment we delivered in November 2018 on the VA's implementation of Sections 107 and 501 of the Forever GI Bill. The focus of that independent assessment, requested by VA's Office of Information Technology, was to identify issues related to the delayed delivery of a long-term solution, or LTS, and to recommend a resolution to the issues associated with completing and deploying the required system updates. The assessment explored the following six areas. One, leadership and governance, two, technical environment, three, process, four, requirements management, five, personnel authorities and responsibilities, and six, software code evaluation. As noted by the assessment, several key findings were related not to technical considerations, but rather to the assignment of responsibilities and questions about governance, authorities, priorities, and goals. Among other things, we identified the need to establish a single cross-organizational business leader and champion for the overall effort, new government governance structures, new program governance structures, including a new light governance council, a program integration office, and an end-to-end -end systems integrator to coordinate planning, development, and integrated testing efforts. To VA's credit, these recommendations and others were fully accepted by the leadership 
soon after our independent technical assessment was completed. Further, progress on implementation of these recommendations have been transparently tracked and reported on by VA. Our current assessment is that these changes have had a significant impact on, on the delivery of this program and that VA will meet the target deployment on December 1 for the planned functionality. As the deployment date approaches, three key milestones have been successfully completed which indicate that the deployment will occur as planned. Specifically, one, the Comeri team has completed all development milestones on or ahead of schedule, including build deadlines and end-to-end -end user acceptance testing. Two, a series of tabletop exercises have been conducted to further verify end-to-end -end operational and functional readiness. And three, two dry runs, equivalent to a full dress rehearsal, are being conducted for the five, Section 501 batch runs to identify any challenges or issues that can be addressed prior to deployment. Information technology programs, especially those requiring a great deal of integration among new technology, legacy systems, and new business rules and processes, are inherently high risk. VA now has in place an integrated program team that is deliberately managing that risk by identifying the critical path activities and decisions needed to, su to succeed and contingencies to mitigate the risk. Going forward, we encourage VA to leverage this model to reduce risk and improve results across the VA's other critical programs by one, adopting this management model enterprise-wide by establishing for each critical program a senior accountable business leader and a light governance council, two, working to strategically simplify the legacy system environment by determining opportunities to modify, modernize, or replace legacy systems as they implement new programs, and three, continuing use of modern information technology methods, processes, and tools that underlie the independent technical assessment recommendations. MITRE remains committed to the success of this initiative in partnership with VA leadership and the selected systems integrator. On behalf of the entire MITRE team, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come before you again today to provide this update, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schnitzer. Uh, with that, uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. Uh, and I now recognize myself for five minutes to begin the question portion uh, of the hearing. Uh, and uh, Under Secretary Lawrence, uh, thanks again for having me to Muskogee uh, recently. Uh, I'll start with the major question that I think we all have today, uh, which is very simple. Is VBA ready? to meet the December 1st implementation date for Sections 107 and 501 of the Forever GI Bill. So I'm glad to hear you say that. You, you say that with confidence. 10 out of 10. Oh, and your microphone, sir. Sorry, 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. All right. Uh, so ready for the spring 2020 semester, particularly since, you know, we know in the past what happened with August 2018. I know that you dedicated a lot of resources within VBA to meet the December 1st implementation date. Uh, and one of the issues, as you know, in August of 18 was the late education claim processing time, which was caused by IT systems and the decision to uh, delay school certifications. So my question for you, Mr. Undersecretary, what have VBA and education services changed to ensure that the processing time will not be longer than normal after December 1st? Um, I'd like to ask Charmaine to jump in here in a second, but I would point out the following last year. Last year, what happened, if uh, you weren't here, I know, um, there was a delay in getting the software ready. So we were always one week away from having the software ready, which delayed the processing. As was pointed out, we received the software in October, so it is ready. So we're ready to roll per normal. So we're not going to have a bunch of held applications waiting us for be, us to be ready. We are ready. But we have taken extensive steps to prepare, hire, and train. I'd like Charmaine to jump in here and explain that. Yes, good, good morning. So basically, we've done a few things. One, we are at the lowest point for our pending inventory right now. 
to prepare for what's coming for the December 1st rollout. So we are traditionally about 60K in terms of our pending inventory. Right now we're at 40K. It's the lowest numbers we've seen since implementation of post 9-11. Number two, we've in the process of hiring nearly 500 employees between temporary and permanent staff members. We're already, already at over 54% when it comes to hiring those members and they will be on board by the end of November ready for the December 1st rollout. And then lastly, we are ready to ramp up for mandatory over time. So right before the spring peak period comes into place in January, we'll kick in for mandatory overtime and folks will be working mandatory overtime. So we are prepared for the spring semester. Thank you uh, for that. In uh, November of 18, uh, MITRE released a report stating that the, uh, you know, basically the, the uh, findings, the, the systems, the processes uh, of the education services at VBA providing a status update uh, and then we had, of course, a hearing in May uh, where VA had completed, I believe, 10 of the 20 recommendations from MITRE. Uh, and as you shared in your testimony, uh, Under Secretary Lawrence, uh, VA has now implemented uh, all 20 of those recommendations, I think, is, is what you said. Just as a point of clarity, when you say implemented, do you mean completed or initiated? Completed. Great. Uh, Under Secretary Lawrence and Dr. Schnitzer, uh, I'd like to hear from both of you on my next question if I could. Uh, what is VA doing to internalize the lessons learned from 2018 uh, and the assistance provided by MITRE, so not just in education services, but across the enterprise? Perhaps I can start, and I'll speak yes, to sir. VBA in particular, and maybe we can get Mr. Jaffer to jump in because I know some of those affect what he does. Um, I think if you recall, three things came about last time which were really important and we decided to implement in VBA on all our significant projects that involve IT. One is an accountable, a clear accountable official responsible for that. So while it's me in this one and other opportunities we do where we have IT, there's a clear accountable business unit leader um, there. The other is we hire the right contractors. We talked about a systems integrator and a software developer in this thing. We make sure we're hiring the right contractors. And we have, while the role is played by MITRE now, and MITRE and some of those in VBA, but elsewise other firms providing program integration and oversight, giving us the expertise to watch over the whole um, initiative. So those are three things we're doing in VBA based on the learning, as Dr. Schnitzer pointed out, from this project. Anything you'd like to add, sir? Uh, thank you. The only thing I'd like to add, and I agree with everything Dr. Lawrence just said, was that uh, some of these lessons are being shared across VA, so from Dr. Lawrence's leadership to leadership in other parts of VA as examples of things to consider, and I know that is, is ongoing at VA as well. Could you maybe give me a specific example of, uh, you know, how VA maybe has changed the process in some area outside of Forever GI Bill implementation uh, from, you know, the work that you've done and the the lessons that have been learned. Can I deflect that to Mr. Jaffer? He has a broader view of the IT. Sure. So again, while the, while the focus was on some of the past mistakes of the previous year, I would point to the current year and what we're doing, and Dr. Lawrence referred to a few of them, but uh, the first thing I would cite is that uh, the department has surely, from a cultural standpoint, shifted to a DevOps mentality, and, and again, at the risk of uh, being too technical, Previously, they had followed a waterfall methodology, which is all requirements are listed up front, uh, and then it, it, it's lot less likely for the program to be successful as opposed to what we refer to as a minimum vi viable product with an Agile. So the department has done that, and then as Dr. Lawrence has said, uh, additionally, the testing, the modernization efforts, uh, the, uh, the tabletop exercise, all of those things that we've done in Mission Act and some of the others have led up to the preparation of the environment and setting the conditions for the launch on December 1st, but also for those days afterwards to make sure that we stabilize the environment, that the software is acting in an in a, in a appropriate fashion, that all the other interconnected systems are contributing to the delivery of the, uh, of the outcomes. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll come back with some more questions, uh, but I want to give my colleagues an opportunity, so I'd like to recognize Congressmember Bergman for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, assuming that the IT modifications are successfully deployed on the 1st of December, what is the plan for providing retroactive payments to student veterans who have been underpaid, some all the way back to August of 2018? 
Certainly. Um, we intend to chew everybody up as promised by the Secretary. Um, there's two parts to this answer I like to draw on. There's an IT component and there's a processing component. So let me start with Mr. Riffesey explaining some of the IT things we need to do. There you go. Right. So as we move forward with the IT components of this, we are currently working. Uh, we started the first sprint towards the development of the retroactive payment piece for Section 107. And that is currently underway. We plan to complete the IT capability for 107 retroactive payments uh, in the winter of this year. And then we'll go into testing activities then for deployment in the spring. Uh, the other component of that is with the December 1st launch, we have a batch process that will run, which will start the true up process for sections 501 of the Comory Act. And that will launch at the stroke of midnight on December 1st. Good. Um, so whoever you want to answer this next one, once it's kind of a follow on, once these needed upgrades are ready, so I'm hearing about March of 2020, will there be a phased in approach to pay students? Is it reasonable to expect that if all the systems uh, work out the way that you hope that the students <coughs> should expect to be made whole by next summer? So that's a good question. So we've been working closely with the schools over the last year in terms of the retroactive piece and going back to correct records. And yes, it will be a phased approach. Our first priority is to pay those who were underpaid for that time frame, and then our second priority is those that were overpaid. And then there's the third category of those where there's no change whatsoever. Also, the phased approach will include, we'll have a set time frame in which we'll allow schools to come back in to certify, to give them ample time, at least a six month window, in order to come back and recertify enrollments for that time period. Um, <clears throat> we believe doing that, it will help with the workload as it relates for the schools, as well as making sure there's no impact to students for the summer and the upcoming fall semesters. So realistically, by a year from now, uh, given your projections, we should be the student should be made whole? Realistically, yes, it should be made whole. It is contingent upon the schools, but the schools are already tracking that information. Uh, we've been working very closely with the schools to make sure that they're tracking the information of those students that are owed funds. But like I said, the first priority is those that are underpaid, that we make that the first priority to get those in the door to make sure that we cut them a check for the difference. Okay, so the earliest would be? So the earliest in terms of those going out the door, I would say by early summer, we'll start seeing checks go out the door. Okay, uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, Section 501 of the Colmary Act requires housing allowance amounts for many students to de decrease uh, with their January 1st payments. What is the VA's plan on how to communicate these changes to the students? And what will the process be for an equitable relief for those students who will see their payments drop by a considerable amount? I'm going to enlist Charmaine in just a second, but I do want to comment on this because I know one of the lessons learned from our interactions last year was uh, real egging on for more communication from us. So we've tried real hard to up our communication game um, in terms of explaining to students, explaining to schools what's going to take place. And as you point out, one of the consequences of this law is the way they change where they get their credits. They will receive less in their housing, monthly housing allowance. And this is a real concern to us. To include us notifying your offices of schools in your state that will be affected by this. But I really want Charmaine to jump in here because this has been a real area of concern. Mm -hmm. So over the last couple of months, we've had some targeted outreach at those with a lower rate zone. Um, it, we called it the 24% campaign. So out of the 8,300 extension campus locations that we collected across the nation, 24% uh, of those locations fall, fall in a lower rate zone. So we targeted those particular areas and worked with schools and students to, to basically push out messaging to inform them of what's transpiring and what's coming down the pike. What we realized is that the majority of schools have already started working with their students to basically ex inform them that if they're spending most of their time at one of those extension campus locations, in a lower rate zone to expect a lower rate and to provide them the information in terms of what that rate will be. Um, also, like as Dr. Lawrence said, just this, uh, just this Monday we put out information to the congressional districts in the area as well to make sure they are aware of what's going on. Also, we've connected with the VSOs so that way they are educated about what's happening. So it's not just the students and the school administrators that we're educating, but it's the community that we're educating about what's happening with the monthly housing allowance changes. Well, well thank and you. I noticed time and is up. Could we just answer the second part of your question, sir, about equitable relief? Sure. And That's the, you know, and I see my time's expired. I know we're going to have a second round here, but, you know, there's an old saying, bad news doesn't get better with time. 
And the point is, if in, it, just, it's not, it just is what it is. And the point is, the sooner our student veterans have an indication that there's going to be a change to the lesser, the better they can plan on the front end. So don't wait until you have all the numbers. Get the word out that there's going to be some changes and the details will come later. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, and I echo those remarks. <laughs> and I'd now like to recognize uh, Ranking Member Rowe for his questions for five minutes. Thank you, and just to follow on, um, with that line of question, I think that's probably uh, the most important part of what you're doing right now. If it's 24 percent, is that 175,000, 200,000 students? About how many students is that? So the 24 percent represents just the extension campus locations for the schools, not the student count. Okay. For the student count, we've done some preliminary work with schools, and what they've indicated that about 16 percent of the student population would be impacted by the 107 piece. And let me equate that to some numbers. Within a term, basically 500,000 students receive a monthly housing allowance. Of those 500,000, 420,000, there's no impact to them because they're staying at their main campus. But about 80,000, 16%, they could be potentially impacted by the 107 changes. And what we're looking at right now, of the 80,000, about 21,000 would receive a lower rate. Well, if we act like we're self-serving, we are because our phones are going to ring off the wall. And then your phones are going to ring off the wall because we're going to be calling you. I think that's the thing. And, and if you're in an area, and as the general said, mm -hmm. um, uh, students, you know, we they don't have too much money. And when you reduce the amount that they have, it's going to be a real impact on some students. And the quicker they get that information, the better. And, I, and again, I want to commend you all for um, for getting this rolled out. I, I'm really excited about how it's going to work. And uh, uh, Dr. Schnitzer, just a couple of things I, I want to ask you. What do you believe are the biggest lessons learned by VA officials in this process, and how can they apply these experiences to improve future IT modifications, whether it be the GI Bill processing or the businesses? I, I think we were, John and I were talking about that, about there should be some lessons learned here. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Rose. So I think the three things are what I mentioned, but I'll call them out specifically as being the most important. I think having a single business leader have ultimate authority within the organization, number one. Number two, having the light governance structure is really critical. And number three, in incorporating the concept of a program integration office. Those three components, and those scale for other issues as well. So those can be used generally. Yeah, so when we, we roll out the next, and there will be a next sometime, I think that's we could certainly utilize what we've learned here to not have this year hiccup, and then give you enough time to if you get the old IT or either invest in new IT where we can roll it out better. Would that be a fair statement? That is correct, sir. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, about the could, you didn't get a chance to finish because you ran out of time on the equitable relief plan. Yes, certainly. We're very sensitive to that. We understand what you were describing about you know, our student veterans um, you know, live on modest incomes. The housing allowance will go down in certain situations, so we want to explain that. We share your concern that they call you and you direct them to us. We'd also like your help to have them indicate this is not a VA failure. This is just how the law and the rules work, so we want to make sure that's well understood. But we're prepared for that. I want Charmaine to talk about equitable relief. So equitable relief will pro provide a one-time relief for students for that particular term. So if they realize that there's a drop in their rate um, for that term, so let's say I'll, I'll use uh, San Fran as a great example. San Fran, the rate's $4,300, but in Sacramento, the rate's about 2500 bucks. So if they realize that they're spending most of their time in the Sacramento area, the difference there, um, they can come in and say, VA, hey, I planned my life around this situation of receiving $4,500. We'll say, hey, we'll do a one-time of the difference for that particular term, and we'll hand that over to the student. We understand that process usually takes um, about three months, so we are working with Tiger teams in our regional processing offices to expedite that to, to have two-week turnaround times all the way up to the secretary because the secretary has to approve all equitable relief requests. Well, I think that's a, 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 the right thing to do and give people who are caught off guard and there will be some no matter how much you try to, to um, do this. One, uh, Dr. Lawrence, I know that the VA has made uh, significant investment in time and resources to improve communication to the schools and students about the changes coming as a result of the Comary Act. Can you just very briefly again go through exactly what you've done and how can we help you get that information out? 
Sure, I'm happy to have Charmaine jump in here because she's done a lot of this. We've really upped our game in terms of just, you know, emails and like, nobody received letters anymore, emails, those sort of, um, as much social media as we could imagine, Facebook, Charmaine's been on Facebook at all the conferences, we have folks who are doing Twitter and the things like that, um, we've been to the conferences, we spoke to the officials, and as I said, I personally have been to roundtables at, at universities to understand if this has happened, so we've taken that counsel really seriously, uh, I'm Charmaine, if you want to jump in here in terms yeah, social media is a powerful tool, I will tell you. And even though we're posting on our media channels, we've asked for your staff as well as for our VSO partners to amplify that messaging, to also post on their social media channels. Um, we usually post a couple times per week. Um, as Dr. Lawrence said, we went out on a national school tour. Uh, you know, New York is a great example. We, were, we went to John Jay College. We went to Columbia University. But we invite all the local schools to come out. The entire CUNY and SUNY system came out and supported us to talk about the changes that's going on and what's happening and how it is applicable to their state. And we continue to continue that dialogue. We also put out um, a simple five-page pamphlet for students about the monthly housing allowance changes. And we will continue doing that, you know, um, in the future as it relates to communications. You know, like Dr. Lawrence said, veterans are not sitting there waiting for a snail mail letter to come in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to recognize uh, Representative Banks for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Lawrence, it's clear that the VA needs to modernize its legacy systems after years of neglect, and I think it's fair to say from what we've heard today that you're committed to doing just that. Could you please share with the committee, though, your plan for a full replacement and what it will cost to avoid the need for a reset in the future, and what will it take uh, in additional financial resources to get there? Um, you're, you're right. Um, part of my experience this journey is that our legacy systems are old and Congressman Bergman talked about updating our legacy systems. I just don't think that is practical anymore. We need to replace them at some point. And for us to have a world-class system for our veterans, you just can imagine what it would take, right? Uh, call center technology that is unbelievably responsive, you know, processing power and the like to be able to deal with the issues we deal with as well as the expected increases in what the, or changes in the GI Bill will bring, right? Our systems right now are inflexible and limit us tremendously and require more resources to be fixed. I'm in the process of reviewing with the CIO and others our initiatives to understand modernization before Colmary as well as beginning to benchmark against some of the like projects we would appreciate that. You can appreciate we'll come forward with an ask through our internal process. We want to make sure that this is done uh, correctly so we don't have to be in this situation again that has to be modest and, quite frankly, done quickly. Con Congressman, if I could just add quickly on that. I don't want anyone to leave here with the impression today that there is a binary decision here. We're not living with just our legacy system. There is a pathway. There is an OIT and a department modernization strategy. We've migrated to the applications to a cloud environment, refactored them and stabilized them. We put in application performance uh, interfaces. Uh, we're doing things around managed services. So there's a host of things between legacy and fully modernized systems that are occurring. Um, it's just, of course, never fast enough or responsive enough for the business. Do both of you feel comfortable that we've identified everything uh, that needs to be modernized in, in order to execute the program? I think we're completing that, completing that analysis, so we're not quite everything yet. How, how close to everything? Pretty close. Okay. I, 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 would, I would be a little more specific and say as part of our joint business plan, every year we have specific goals within what we intend to accomplish given the restraints of funding and other, you know, constraints. Uh, that, you know, again, with, with the CR environment, too, that adds a, an additional level of kind of uh, to the Rubik's Cube for this year, which makes it a little more challenging. I'm not sure if that makes me more or less uh, comfortable, but with, but with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, uh, Representative Banks. Uh, I'd now like to recognize Representative Muser for five minutes. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all uh, very much. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, what has been stated here is uh, some very encouraging news and information. Uh, December 1st, you have 100% <clears throat> likelihood to, to go online. Um, by early summer, I, I think I heard right, uh, Ms. Bogue, is that it, Charmaine? That is uh, correct. <laughs> okay, thank you. That you'll have a true up on all past um, 
all past inequities that have existed. Uh, all milestones are, have been achieved uh, up until now. Uh, you mentioned the tabletop executions are t taking place well. Uh, you've had two stress tests or, or dry runs that seem to have gone well. Uh, also, you have an integrated program team to implement and mitigate risk. So all this is, uh, is, is quite encouraging. Um, I do want to mention, just in, in the, what I'm reading here, Accenture refers to the legacy systems as ancient. So that's, um, uh, that's something I want to, want to ask you about. As I, um, well, first of all, is Accenture proved to be a good partner? They've successfully completed all the tasks we've asked, to, asked them to do, so the answer is yes. Great. And um, uh, the past failures that have existed, and let's face it, there, there have been some past failures. Um, so why, what have we done to, and follow, obviously following these principles, uh, and a new team, uh, which, um, uh, again, um, I, I applaud, but what do you base where, wh why these legacy systems have remained ancient and why have we been put into a position where we did have such uh, large past failures? Dr. Lawrence. I'll start, I'll start and I'll ask Mr. Jaffer, the CIO, to jump in here. I don't really have a good answer to that. I don't know whether it was failure to listen to perhaps the coaching from the committee to really take a step back and deal with the bigger problem ahead versus the short-term solution to a problem and not see what's coming. I've had the unique experience this year to really appreciate this is the 75th anniversary of the GI Bill, right? And it gets modernized regularly. It'll be modernized again right, as more benefits are expanded. So I don't know that the leaders had the chance to really appreciate what that meant and argue for a little more pain and a little more money, understanding the benefits would be longer. I don't know, Mr. Jaffer. Yeah. Uh, I guess the thing I would emphasize is I certainly talked to my counterparts in commercial financial services, right, to compare notes, and the challenges aren't entirely dissimilar, right? They face the same obstacles in terms of percent of spend and, and you know, up upgrading and modernizing their legacy systems. Um, so I, I, I think that's one thing, right? I don't, I don't, I wouldn't want the committee to, to feel like the government is so far out in left field as compared to like private sector counterparts. There are a lot of the same headwinds and struggles. Yeah. Uh, I can assure you that. Um, secondarily, again, I think uh, when you look at some of the timelines, I think the chairman and others mentioned the kind of challenging timelines. You know, I'd point to Mission Act, for example. When you get very complex pieces of legislation that have to go through the entire rulemaking period, which eventually go into user requirements, and then you look at like about five or six months being left to develop the software and the code to meet these very exotic systems, that can be incredibly challenging. And Mission Act, for example, I've been on record that we essentially did four months of development that if in a corporate entity, you would have probably taken 18 to 24 months. So I, again, I think there's some expectation management, you know, working with the committee around what we can achieve in a certain time frame. And, and I can appreciate that. I, I was Secretary of Department of Revenue in Pennsylvania, and when a new tax code would come in, there'd be, be a mad rush to, uh, to certainly integrate and implement. Uh, and we, we did work with uh, Accenture uh, relatively uh, successfully as well. So, but Mr. Schitzer, my, my question to you is, would these principles and lessons learned that you described, can they be applied elsewhere throughout the VA system? Yes, sir. And not only through, uh, across the VA system, but elsewhere in the federal government. I would just point out that some of the the challenges that have been shared by my colleagues within VA and uh, and, and its uh, various agencies apply elsewhere in the federal government as well. And are they saving money? Using these approaches? Uh, saving money, perhaps, but more importantly, providing better services. Higher really. quality, better delivery systems. Okay, great. And it was mentioned uh, by Ms. Bogue that there were 500,000 students that are within this, the, GI Bill and, and uh, receiving the housing nationwide? So every term, um, we have about 500,000 students yes. who are receiving a monthly housing allowance because they are their course load is more than half time. Okay. So that's that number. And that's I'm out of time, but can we get a listing, a spreadsheet of where those 500,000 are, where they go to school? Sure. Yes. Great. We can provide I, that I information. Yield, thank you very much. You're welcome. I yield back, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Muser. Some uh, additional questions uh, for Under Secretary Lawrence. Uh, again, it was really a, a pleasure getting to spend uh, the day in Muskogee, Oklahoma, uh, understanding from your team there how uh, GI Bill benefits are processed. Uh, I particularly appreciate the opportunity to sit down with one of the call center uh, workers and, and just listen in on several of the calls and, and just try to understand in real time uh, the complexity of being able to process those benefits. And one of the things I noticed is that they used a number of different uh, applications, a number of different uh, software systems running simultaneously. Um, how many different uh, applications does one of those call center workers have to use uh, as they're processing one of those claims? So for the education call center agent, it depends on the question that's coming in the door, but nine times out of 10, the question coming in the door is about the status of their particular benefits. Um, so they would probably have to use about three or four systems um, in order to look at that information. So one of those systems is our long-term solution, which will tell you where the information is processed, and then we have our benefits delivery network, which is another system which will tell you when the money has been released and to verify banking information across the board. Um, and then we have our normal um, CRM tool, the client, relations management tool, which is the call center management tool. So those are three examples of a system they could use from day to day on, on, for each call. And for the, the main uh, database with a lot of the uh, personal information of the veteran, what uh, programming language uh, is that dependent on? I think you saw us using COBOL that day. Co COBOL. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. And I think okay. that was created in 1959 and was uh, popularized in 1968. Um, so I was born in 1978, okay. uh, so, uh, you know, it's obviously a dated uh, technology. Um, given that, and, and, you know, this is being kind to say that Windows OS machines usually last about a decade, usually doesn't last that long, uh, how, how are you able to, to integrate and use software that's uh, now 50 plus years old? Uh, well, first, I would say uh, that the federal standards around tech refresh for uh, microcomputers, what you're saying, uh, is about four years, sir. It's uh, 10 years would be, uh, that would be <laughs> below suboptimals, just to set just the record. I'm happy if my phone lasts through the, the year. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so your your question was around the legacy systems and just, you know, what we're doing. Again, I would tell you that it's not a static, it's not the same COBOL, for example, that was started in 1959, there have been modification language, and then we start to put technology in between that, the application performance interfaces, again, so we can web enable them and tie them to those systems. Um, and then we're always looking for ways to combine functionality. So again, it's, it's, it could be a little misleading if we led you to believe that literally the same architecture that was on veterans benefit management system that was coded in the 60s or the 70s exists today. There's been a lot of updates um, along that, M much like you would if uh, in DoD with an aircraft, right, where it may be the existing shell, but the guts, the internal, you know, avionics and all those things are are much more upgraded. Well, I certainly respect and appreciate all the hard work over decades of getting the system to, uh, you know, function uh, with uh, interoperability of, of Oracle databases, Microsoft databases, and the like. Uh, but clearly, you know, it is very out of date. Uh, are there other um, databases that are used throughout uh, VBA uh, that also rely on things like COBOL, or, or is that something that's specific to education services? And I guess is that something that uh, we need to address only in education services, or is it a part of a far larger discussion? Well, I, I will start off with that. It's certainly uh, enterprise-wide, right? I mean, we're here with Veterans Benefits Administration today, but again, we have an integrated network uh, throughout, and our, a lot of our development efforts are similar across the administrations and the corporate portfolio. Rob, I don't know if you want to focus beyond that. Uh, thank you. When it comes to specifically to COBOL and to BDN, education service is a majority of the functionality remaining on that BDN legacy system. Right. And if I could just add, in the space of education, just to give you context, we actually utilize 23 systems to process education benefits across our six programs. That's all helpful. And, you know, count me among those that absolutely believe we need to modernize uh, this system. I, I was uh, completely convinced of that. And I think everybody is working really hard and doing the very best they can with the software that they've got, the resources that they have, which uh, leads me to the next question is, which, what, what resources do you need? from Congress, from us, to ensure that uh, as you overhaul this system uh, from COBOL uh, to something that is modern, 
uh, and sustainable going forward? What is it that you'll need? Congressman, I, we're, we're certainly in discussions with OMB around what we think are the future investments necessary to modernize the system. We've found a very receptive audience with our colleagues there. So we're, we're quantifying that. Uh, also in our past meeting with you, I complimented and thank again the Congress on in the FY20 budget, there is actually a line around infrastructure readiness. Uh, so again, addressing that technical debt that creeps into any organization, government or otherwise. So I, I think we're uh, directionally, we're heading in the right direction. It's always a question of managing around the resources that are available, but I, but I think largely we're heading in the right direction. Do you have any other unfunded mandates that would take precedence over overhauling your infrastructure? I, I think that's a great question. I, and I know uh, with Dr. Lawrence and VBA, again, as a partnership, I think one of the challenges that occasionally gets uh, left out is that with the centralized appropriation in VA, when a pre piece of legislation is passed, I think we need to do a better job of communicating with, with the committee and the author and the appropriators around making sure that sufficient resources are added. Otherwise, we do, as you said, uh, are impacted by unfunded requirements sometimes in the current year of execution. So my last question, I know Congress authorized $30 million in the Forever GI Bill to fund the IT modifications that the bill mandated, but that the funds were never appropriated. Do you anticipate that this $30 million or perhaps additional funding uh, for the IT infrastructure overhaul will be requested in the President's fiscal year 2021 budget? Congressman, what I, what I would say is that uh, we certainly have an unfunded requirements process that we have worked with our Office of Enterprise Integration and our Chief Financial Officer this year. So we are addressing that uh, with respect to any reprogramming or supplementals or future year budget requests that might come out of that. I'm, I'm not prepared to address that this time. Anybody else care to comment on that? No. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Congressmember Bergman uh, for additional questions. Okay. Um, we're 11 days from crossing the line of departure. Those of you who have served in uniform know exactly what that means because no plan survives first contact. Okay. So I'd like to just start right here, Ms. Bogue, and go down the line. What in your mind is going to be the single biggest pop-up that stuff is hitting the fan in the wrong direction on the 1st of December or shortly thereafter? You want to go out and make a prediction here? I'm not going to say hit the fan. What I'm going to say is my concern is making sure that we are over communicating, right? I want to make sure that we're communicating at all levels to make sure that students and schools and everyone is aware the changes are rolling out and to understand the impact to students. So that what keeps me up at night to make sure that we have a so robust let me ask you, hold communication on, hold on. plan. That's, okay, I, I, and that's a nice, that's a good answer. Okay. But the point is, what's your preparation? Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you're not going to verbalize necessarily what could hit the fan, um, what's your preparation for when it does, whatever the it is? Mm -hmm. I believe that we're very prepared and I don't foresee anything hitting the fan. Um, but I will tell you that between our office as well as OIT, we have a pretty aggressive strategy to have all boots on the ground and all hands on deck to make sure that we mitigate for any issues so that no, come up. So all liberties December canceled. <laughs> all what? All liberties canceled all during the fight. Okay, right. Dr. Lawrence. We spent an awful lot of time over the last year thinking about this, and I'm not so certain what the milita military analogy is, is sort of getting to fight the war over again, you get to start again, because I think we had a lot of time last year to figure out what we didn't enjoy about our previous work. So that gave us a real baseline. What Dr. Snitzer talked about and the CIO alluded to is we've had numerous tabletops where we plan through what's going to happen on December 1st. So we've anticipated as much as we think we can and we're prepared for that. But your point is there might still be something else. So that's what we're worrying about. But as Charmaine pointed out, December 1st is on a Sunday, so we're working on Thanksgiving. We have people ready to jump in to help deal with all the situations situations, but we know what's at stake because the period of time last year, and it was described in the statements about veterans waiting for uh, their checks, something we don't want to have happen. Most of us are veterans in the VA, you know that, so we feel this very personally. So we'd like to think we've anticipated everything, but we're prepared for things we haven't thought about. Okay. Mr. Jiffer? Well, General, I don't get a chance often to use the military parlance, so I'll, I'll talk in terms that you'll probably accept. In terms of shaping, sustaining, and decisive, 
shaping. We've uh, taken the network and all of the architecture. We've uh, done a freeze moratorium on systems that could introduce additional risk. We've done the testing in terms of the systems to make sure that they will interact properly. In terms of sustaining, as was mentioned earlier, we have a robust incident management plan. Uh, it's been rehearsed through these tabletops. As Dr. Lawrence said, we have an Enterprise Command Operations Center that's 24-7. People will be on a call within minutes if a, if a related system is experiencing latency or some challenges. Um, and then I would say decisive, uh, the resources will be brought to bear. Even on Sunday, December 1st, if a particular system, if there's a bandwidth issue, whatever, uh, we will bring to bear all of our power with the, uh, with the Enterprise Command Operations Team, with the service desk, and with our commercial providers to make sure that, uh, that those challenges are addressed uh, with, like I said, literally within minutes. Thank you. Mr. Orfisi? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, looking at this, I think we've looked at everything that's gone wrong in the past year and anything that's caused an inc incidents with our systems, and we've prepared scenarios around those and how to remediate and effectively remove those issues. And we have practiced those. We've run mock calls where we pulled people in and worked through these exercises. So with the level of planning, I'm hoping for a smooth run, but we're prepared for the obstacle course if we encounter it. Doctor? Uh, sir, somebody a lot smarter than me once said predictions are hard, especially about the future, so I don't think I can predict how things will go off the rails uh, exactly, uh, but your point is well taken. Something always happens that's unexpected and unpredicted. Mm -hmm. I think the mitigation in this case is the quality of the team, and I think the difference now is that we've got people who have been through it before. Uh, there's plenty on the bench and who are really well prepared at this point with really good systems in place and good support. So I think there's uh, readiness and people willing to step up and deal with it when it comes who know how to do so. Uh, well, you know, thank you for all for your, for your honesty because number one, things are gonna happen and there are gonna be mistakes that are made. Please try to make them be new mistakes. That's the key because it'll show if we make the same mistake again, we didn't learn and I'm very appreciative of all your efforts to ensure that we will embrace the change on behalf of the veterans. So thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, General Bergman. Bergman. I'd like to uh, recognize Ms. Luria uh, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Dr. Lawrence, uh, Ms. Bogue, for appearing again um, after the last time uh, you appeared before the subcommittee in May. Um, I sent a letter uh, specifically addressing the correction of the underpayments in section 107 and 501. Um, unfortunately, I'm still awaiting a response to that letter, so I thought today's uh, hearing would be a good opportunity to follow up on some of those questions. Um, and at that time, I asked if you could estimate approximately how many students have been underpaid. Do you have that data now? So we did talk about that a little bit earlier, and what we said is um, over the last year, we've basically been working with the schools to obtain information through our focus groups and our webinars. And based off of data from the schools, what we realized is about 16% of their student population would be impacted um, by the 107 changes. And what that equates to in terms of numbers, for each term, about 500,000 students receive a monthly housing allowance. Of the 500,000, 420,000 will not be impacted because they're still gonna remain at the main campus location. So the remaining 80%, 16%, will basically have some impact as it relates to the 107 changes. Of the 80,000, 22,000 uh, potentially will receive a lower rate, and then 40,000, no change whatsoever, and then 19,000, they will receive actually a higher rate. And again, um, I just wanna add that those are preliminary numbers that have come in the door. Once we flip the switch on December 1st and we continue to monitor new enrollments coming in the door, those numbers will shift and we'll make sure to provide updates in, in January timeframe in terms of the latest numbers after we flip the switch. Well, thank you. And um, based off understanding that you're still collecting data to come up with the finite number of students who are impacted, my next question was, what is the price tag? Um, so I understand that you might not have a, an exact number now, but do you have an estimate of the range of the amount um, as far as um, people who are owed more funds based off the change. And then if I'm correct, um, those who were overpaid uh, will not be financially impacted. There's a, a, a 
a process by which they um, can have those fees waived if they've been previously overpaid throughout this process? So you're talking about two aspects. The piece I just mentioned is the point forward piece for any new term that starts on or after December 1st. The second part of that is the retroactive piece when we'll have to go back and correct records. But that piece won't happen until the spring time frame when we go back to correct records and we'll have a better sense of the funding piece as it relates to overpayments and underpayments for that retroactive piece. Um, but anyone who is overpaid will not have a financial that burden is correct. for that. Anyone who is overpaid, we will review their um, information, make sure it was solely based on the 107 issue, and we will waive that debt. That is a correct statement. Um, the next thing I wanted to focus on was the IT systems for implementing this. I know that um, you know this is a, a change that requires um, you know different programming, different systems uh, for communication. And uh, while talking to some of our subcommittee staff who had the opportunity to, to visit the regional office in Muskogee, it was brought to their attention that there was not the possibility to communicate electronically with students who were impacted. Can you comment on that? And then what types of systems you might be able to put in place to smooth that communication between affected students for this and other issues and then um, just smoothing out the process to make it more efficient? So I'm unclear of this particular issue as it relates to Muskogee, but we are able to uh, connect with students electronically. So actually at the local level, VCs, claims examiners are able to email students if they if they need to. However, if there's certain PII information, then we're not able to share that through via email channels because of the security natures of it. Also at a national level, right here in headquarters, we also communicate with students on major changes that are happening to the program. We have an email distribution of over 700,000 students in our database, and anytime there's any changes to the GI Bill program, we're emailing students at the national level. So the PII specifically for an individual's claim, does that hinder the process? Because I would assume that there is information that has to go back, um, back and forth, bank account information, those types of things. So Correct. is there no secure process by which that information can be exchanged? Not via email, but we have another tool called Right Now Web, which is available on our website, and, a, and an individual can use that tool to communicate via um, electronically. Well, and I would add, too, the information in eBenefits is a secure system, and it can be uh, updated and reviewed in there. And we are in the process of all of those are consolidating down on va.gov. And again, as a, as a recipient within Veterans Benefits, I sat down with our CTO, Mr. Charles Worthington, and actually looked at where I can uh, verify my e-benefits direct deposit information. So all that functionality is collapsing down on va.gov, part of our modernization efforts. Well, thank you, and appreciate the efforts towards modernization. And I We'll go take a look at that myself so that I can become familiar with uh, what's available there for, for veterans. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd now like to recognize Mr. Muser uh, for additional questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually don't have any more questions. I really just want to uh, thank you all for your great work. Thank you for your service. Thank you for taking care of the over 50,000 veterans that I have in Pennsylvania's 9th Congressional. And um, Godspeed. Thank you, Mr. Muser. Uh, if there are no further questions, we can uh, begin to bring this hearing to a close. I want to thank our witnesses again uh, for joining us today. Uh, and I thank you for your hard work as we approach uh, December 1st. Uh, it's clear to me from my visit to Muskogee, my conversations with many of you, that you're working incredibly hard uh, towards a uh, successful uh, December 1st deadline. I, I thank you sincerely for that. It's also pretty clear to me that uh, we've got to make some real investments uh, in the modernization of our uh, technology uh, for uh, the GI Bill and, and for uh, education benefits. Uh, and uh, you have my unwavering commitment uh, that as long as I'm in Congress, I will work uh, with you and try to uh, convince my colleagues, uh, however we uh, need to, uh, that uh, the very least we can do for our veterans who've served, who've given so much to our country, is to make sure that we can uh, process their benefits quickly using uh, sustainable uh, and modern technology. Uh, all members will have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks uh, and include additional materials. So without objection, this subcommittee stands adjourned.